We're recording on December 20th, 1995. We're talking with Jack McBride, who is a general manager of the Nebraska Educational Television Network and the director of University Television, professor of broadcasting at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Jack, first let's start out about how, how did you get interested in broadcasting originally? Well, uh, I had uh, come back from uh, uh, a brief stint in the waning months of the Second World War to pick up my, uh, uh, to complete my undergraduate degree at, uh, at, at Creighton University and uh, became interested during that period uh, in uh, the Omaha Community Playhouse and uh, appeared in a number of presentations at the, uh, at the Playhouse and as a matter of fact uh, Met my wife in one of the in, in, in one of the uh, community playhouse uh, uh, plays, and uh, that interested me interested me very much in uh, in, in in dramatics, and uh, I knew also uh, about the, the 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 forthcoming television industry in its very early early days. Um, uh, WW Radio in Omaha was very interested in, in uh, the opportunity to activate a television station. The Federal Communications Commission had a freeze after the war on uh, uh, granting TV licenses. But uh, Johnny Gillen, the uh, very far-sighted general manager of, w, of a successful WW radio station, in anticipation of applying for a television license, um, had arranged with Creighton University <coughs> to use the, the, its, uh, its auditorium and stage to do a considerable amount of, uh, of testing so that uh, the uh, radio enterprise would be able to make a successful transition to television <coughs> uh, as soon as the freeze was lifted and the Federal Communications Commission was willing to grant a construction permit and then a uh, license. And so several of us um, uh, uh, worked uh, 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 very, very uh, briefly and in minimal positions uh, on on some of the uh, experimental productions that uh, were being offered uh, uh, by WOW uh, on the Creighton stage, there was a, a, a specially built little uh, uh, little uh, control booth uh, on the side of the stage, and uh, the stage uh, and its lighting really became. What uh, what was an erstwhile television television studio, and uh, the the tubes at that time were so primitive that you needed blue lipstick uh, and uh, and other uh, uh, manifestations of the color blue in order to be able to uh, make full use of the image orthicon tubes. So so. <coughs> This this was a marvelous opportunity very very early on in the uh, in the pioneering days of television to uh, get a taste of this. So upon upon graduation uh, from Creighton, I then had in mind doing graduate work at Northwestern. Northwestern had a national reputation in terms of uh, radio and uh, training for radio and radio education. <clears throat> so I did graduate work at Northwestern and again, because television was very much in its infancy, uh, by that time the, the, uh, the, uh, the interconnection, the, uh, the, the, the cable between New York and Chicago had just been put through and so there was the opportunity to observe what was called at that time the uh, the Chicago School of, of, of Television. Uh, three people very important to the early days of television were involved, uh, uh, one of which 
was himself a, uh, uh, an instructor uh, at Northwestern, Bob Banner, who went on to, to, to do uh, the Dave Garraway show from Chicago, to do the Fred Waring show, and, uh, and uh, introduced a number of, of, of television staging uh, uh, implementations that, uh, that became standard in future years and did uh, a number of very, very creative productions. Bill Coben was another veteran of, of, of those early days and, uh, and uh, uh, has continued to this day to be uh, a, uh, an executive producer of uh, television programs in, uh, in Hollywood. Don Meyer had just <coughs> begun the predecessor to uh, Zoo Parade and uh, one summer uh, while I was still at uh, Chicago I had the opportunity uh, uh, to, uh, because of vacations to fill in as a floor manager uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, Don uh, Meyer and the production. Marlon Perkins had still been, or was, uh, at the, uh, I forget the name of the Chicago uh, Zoo, but uh, he's the one who went very, very successfully uh, uh, into a zoo parade with Don Meyer. Don <laughs> left uh, the uh, the uh, uh, work at uh, Chicago started on his own, and you know the rest of that uh, that marvelous history uh, that that lasted for such a long, long time, uh, all the way up until Marlon Perkins uh, Perkins' death. And Don Meyer, a guy from Nebraska too. Don Meyer from originally from Nebraska for sure. Um, the, uh, th there was a lot of pioneering uh, at that time uh, in, in terms of uh, television. Uh, WBKB, uh, uh, Barney Caliban uh, 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 had, uh, had uh, uh, invented uh, some, some, some television uh, equipment that was, was being used. And uh, it was at this time that the very first telev color television was 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 shown on uh, uh, in, in in Chicago. I can remember the uh, uh, Michigan Avenue, and a couple of stores there in the store windows were displaying uh, for the first time for Chicagoans uh, what color television looked like, and people gathered in storefronts outside in the street and in throngs watched watched the first color television of the uh, of the day. What year was this approximately? Well, let's see. I finished at Creighton in in uh, 1949, so it would have been from from the fall of 49 uh, to uh, 51, uh, to early 51. Uh, and uh, so that was uh, that that I I I knew uh, for sure that I wanted to stay in television. However, at the time, <coughs> I was thinking, I was thinking commercial television. And, uh, and, uh, uh, something happened then. I was simply, I was simply waiting to join the staffs of one of the three commercial television stations in, uh, in, in Chicago and uh, was simply waiting for the next opening when I got the call from Creighton <coughs> to, to, to come back. There was, there was all of a sudden an opening uh, uh, to teach radio, television, and dramatics, if you will, at Creighton because the individual who was there was had just accepted a job uh, at one of the television stations, I think it was NBC television, in Chicago. <laughs> and, and this individual went on to become a, an extremely well-known, uh, Dwayne Bogey, I think his name was, went on to become an extremely well-known uh, uh, television producer of, of live dramatic programs and has, has continued for a long, long time <clears throat> doing just that. So I went back ostensibly 
ostensibly for just a short period of time and on short notice uh, in, 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 in the middle of a, uh, an academic year to replace him, but became very intrigued about doing educational television programs because Creighton had an arrangement by this time with the brand new WOW uh, television station. This was before the T was added. Uh, uh, had a, an op opportunity to do a 15-minute a uh, television program. And so I became all of a sudden the producer of that television program along with uh, directing uh, two uh, two uh, uh, plays at Creighton uh, each year, and along with doing a, uh, a, a writing and directing a uh, radio program uh, on I forget which uh, which Omaha radio station it was. So I was, and 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 teaching uh, some classes. I was I was an all-purpose <laughs> something or other in 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 in, in those days, but I, I I became fascinated with 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 uh, the uh, education and educational aspects <clears throat> and possibilities with the new television medium. I had an offer then to go to Wayne University, now Wayne State University in Detroit, to to uh, uh, work with them in radio and television and teach courses and so uh, moved there uh, to uh, and and did their 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 their, their packaging a, a few educational programs for uh, one or another of the uh, Detroit stations. Uh, we did a series uh, uh, at that time that received a, a major award. Uh, it was called International Town because Detroit was very much a melting pot of a large number of ethnic groups and this series uh, uh, dealt with uh, all of the uh, resources and uh, and uh, positive aspects of uh, the, uh, the 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 many different ethnic groups that were part and parcel of of, of Chicago, but it won a uh, I forget what it was a Freedom's Foundation Award or something uh, uh, early on, <coughs> but at, uh, after a year and a half there. Uh, George Round, then Director of Public Relations for the University of Nebraska, this was long before uh, there was any <coughs> university system, uh, had uh, contacted me with the, uh, with the offer to come back to Nebraska and start doing uh, uh, television uh, programming for the university. So in the uh, in in August of 1954, I uh, uh, Gene and I moved uh, back to Nebraska, and originally it was to to uh, uh, produce University of Nebraska programs for the uh, television stations. And at that time, this, this was even before Channel 7, uh, KETV, was activated. There were, there, were, there were two in Omaha, and there were two in Lincoln, KOLN-TV and KFOR-TV. And uh, uh, the opportunity pre presented itself then uh, to get uh, airtime uh, to start packaging <coughs> television programs for the, the several uh, new uh, television stations, and uh, this then led to the the opportunity. Uh, let's see, this was this was the fall of '54, and and in early '55, John Fetzer, uh, owner of radio and television stations in in uh, Michigan, bought. Uh, KOLN TV and also bought out 
KFOR TV, and under the duopoly rule of the FCC, was required to dispose of one of those channels. He uh, contacted then new chancellor Clifford Hardin, who had come from Michigan State, and Michigan State had been doing some television uh, programming. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, therefore, Cliff Harden was, was really uh, aware of how television might be used educationally as well. And a, a very uh, interesting and uh, convoluted uh, procedure was developed that finally got FCC approval to see uh, one of those channels uh, turned over to become uh, a non-commercial television uh, station. Uh, originally, in order to make this possible, it was licensed to a trustee, Byron Dunn, then president of the National Bank of Commerce, uh, uh, served as trustee and held the license uh, uh, originally until it was until uh, things could be worked out, and it then was transferred to the Board of Regents of the University of uh, of Nebraska. How did Byron Dunn get that opportunity? How? Well, he was very civically minded in the first place, and I'm I'm sure a great supporter of the University of uh, of, of Nebraska, and. Uh, uh, I'm not quite sure who went to him, whether it was uh, uh, then the Chancellor, Cliff, uh, Cliff Harden, uh, or whether it was in, in the company of, uh, of John Fetzer and Jim Ebel, who, had, uh, who was brought in, uh, who was brought in uh, t as a manager uh, for John Fetzer of uh, Channel 10. Uh, originally, as I recall, uh, KOLN had channel 10 and KFOR TV had channel 12 and so uh, uh, the switch was made so that KOLN could, could operate on channel uh, 10 uh, leaving channel 12 for this, this new uh, operation. So the <coughs> transmitter of channel 12 was in the KOLN building and the antenna was on the KOLN tower adjacent to the building, and the antenna and the transmitter were, were transferred, title was transferred uh, ultimately to the University of Nebraska as soon as the license was, was developed. But there was no studio, the university had no television studio, an ingenious arrangement was, was, was devised uh, by uh, Jim Ebel uh, so that our station could operate out of KOLN concurrently with a commercial station operation. And it was, and you, you look back on it, it was an unbelievable situation. We began broadcasting three hours a morning, five days a week, Monday through Friday, 9 to 12 in the morning. And we operated <clears throat> from the, uh, uh, the, the facilities of, of, of KOLN using uh, their announce booth and how, how, how they managed it and how we managed it. As I look back on it, I don't know, but, but it, it, it worked and worked well until such time as we were able to, to, uh, uh, to uh, design and construct the, the, the first studio uh, uh, for the university. Now Jack, you were the, as I understand it then, the initial employee of the university's television, educational television operation, and you hence became the general manager. But what were your responsibilities at this time? Were you still doing production? Originally, yes. Yes, we were still doing, we were still doing uh, certain programming. As a matter of fact, one of the early and, and, and now very, very, very famous uh, educational television series 
was the Great Plains Trilogy. Uh, the National Associ of e Association of Educational Broadcasters, uh, uh, now uh, no longer in existence, at the time had some Ford Foundation funding. This was right at the time, uh, very early on, when the Ford Foundation first became interested in the potentials of, of, of educational television, as it was called then. And uh, uh, because of that, in the early years, put millions of dollars into uh, assisting with the, uh, the uh, development of, uh, of, of educational television across the country. They had placed a certain uh, small amount of money with the National Association of Edu Educational Broadcasters to encourage the production of, of, uh, of uh, educational programming. And uh, this was done so because they had just, they had also put money into something called the Educational uh, uh, Television and Radio Center, which was headquartered, it was born and headquartered uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, close to the University of Michigan uh, campus. And a uh, former president of uh, Oregon University by the name of Harry Newburn was, was uh, named the first president of, of the ETRC which was really formed to assist the fledgling uh, uh, non-commercial educational television stations that had been activated to that point. It was in 1953 that KUHT at the University of, Her of Houston activated the first non-commercial educational television station on uh, what was called an asterisked channel, the FCC, <laughs> thanks to uh, Commissioner Frida Hennick uh, at that time, uh, she championed the reservation of an important number of, of uh, television allocations and, and put asterisks beside them, denoting that they could be used, they could, n could not be applied for commercially, but had to be used only on a non-commercial basis. And uh, as we activated our station, November 1 of 1954, we, we uh, became then the eighth such station in the, uh, the country to, to uh, 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 begin uh, programming uh, e educational fair. We now are the seventh because there was only one station that, uh, that uh, actually went dark. And this was uh, an early attempt at establishing a station in Los Angeles. I can't remember the call letters. It, uh, it was activated. It uh, operated for a short period of time, maybe a year and a half or two. Or, uh, it, it, uh, it, it subsequently went dark. But concurrent with, with uh, back to your question, concurrent with activating the yeah, the KUON TV, as 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 it was named, uh, we were still packaging programs, uh, uh, and we were doing. Uh, George Round had, prior to my coming, in the fall of '93, had worked with uh, KOLN and had started a program called Backyard Farmer. And it had been on the air probably about eight or eight months before I came. So one of my responsibilities was to take over and, and produce Backyard Farmer uh, and, uh, and uh, then to, 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 to start packaging other programs as well. Back to NAEB and the Ford Foundation funding, we applied for uh, what at the time seemed like a magnificently large grant of $9,000 toward the production of, 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 of something uh, that was called the Great Plains Trilogy. Um, I was intrigued after I came here to find out that uh, uh, there was this marvelous resource, the uh, University of Nebraska State Museum, and Elephant Hall, and all of the uh, 
uh, paleontology and, uh, and uh, fossils, and uh, this was a real strength. Also intrigued by the fact that uh, uh, the Nebraska State Historical Society Museum had such a, uh, such a collection. And uh, uh, we, we devised a, uh, a 39, oh, looking back on it, it was unbelievably <laughs> ambitious. I can't believe it. In, in, in those early, early days, but activated a, uh, uh, we, we, we designed a 39 program series that actually was three 13 program series. Uh, one uh, uh, was paleontological, uh, and uh, C. Bertrand Schultz, who at that time headed the museum and was, was nationally and internationally known uh, in, as a paleontologist. Uh, uh, he was the chief talent on, on that 13 programs that started, <laughs> if, if you will, with the creation of the universe. We, did, we, 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 we really decided to do this right, and we carried that through uh, uh, the first 13 weeks. The second 13 work, weeks were archaeological, and, uh, and uh, uh, Mott Davis, a professor of anthropology at the time, uh, worked on that and was the chief talent. And then the third was historical. And uh, Jim Olson, who was then the director of the State Museum, since went on to move to uh, become the chairman of the history department at Nebraska, then went on to become president and first, uh, I believe, of the uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City, and then of the University of Missouri system until his, his, his retirement. He was the talent on the third. This series uh, worked well, but th 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 there was a very special thing done at the time that uh, ended up being done elsewhere. At this time, all there was uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, medium uh, was, was film to record, 16 millimeter film. So what we did was aired the program live on KOLN and uh, used that as a dress rehearsal and went down to a makeshift film studio in the bowels of West Stadium. This is long before they, uh, they have uh, put together uh, and the, the weight rooms and all of the other goodies down at the, at, 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 uh, the stadium. But there was a makeshift film room and we, in segments, uh, used the uh, university, uh, uh, Wendell Hoffman and his small film crew, and, and uh, I, I served as director of that, and we filmed uh, uh, these 39 programs, which then were used, were sent to the Educational Television and Radio Center that was eagerly looking for whatever programming they could find, and the Great Plains Trilogy was therefore sent to each of the then existing television stations uh, for, for broadcast, not once, but several, <laughs> several times, and it became very well known. Bert Schultz told me repeatedly that in his travels about the, the country, he was recognized in San Francisco and so forth and so on. So it became one of the, uh, one of the early syndicated programs, <laughs> educational programs, if you will. What year was this, Jack? Oh, this was, this was in the 1950s and would have been probably 55, 56, 57. In your, your reference, you talked about doing this live on KOLN. Was that KOLN or KUON at that point? It was. We were doing that on KOLN, 
and repeating it uh, on K-U-O-N. Uh, but uh, that, that, that showed us, or that, 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 was the first, that was the first series that showed us that we had the opportunity to, to uh, maybe produce programming that could be used, uh, could be used elsewhere. Uh, yes, I, 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 I was the first hired by, by the university, and originally it was simply to come in and produce package programs, but when the opportunity came for the university to uh, actually have its own television uh, station then, it was necessary to start uh, hiring, uh, hiring other people. And uh, uh, at that time, I think we had a, uh, we ended up with maybe four or five people, and that was it. <laughs> we were, we were uh, four, four individuals and a secretary uh, were operating a television station. Now, the, the, you mentioned the um, production facility being shared with KOLN at 40th and, and uh, W Streets in those days, but where were the offices? Where did you, where did your four or five people well, operate when I, from? Well, when, when I first came, I had an office in the uh, with with the uh, university's uh, public relations staff, George Round and Ken Keller and uh, Ed Hirsch uh, and uh, Bruce uh, Nickel, and this was on the second floor of a building uh, on between Twelfth uh, and Thirteenth and R, uh, and. Uh, with the advent of the television station and the need to, so, so it was just me and a secretary then. With the advent of the television station, uh, uh, we obviously had to have uh, uh, additional quarters. We were moved over to the second floor of then Stout Hall, the civil engineering uh, building at the time. They had a, a bit of extra space, so we had one large room uh, for for the four or five of us uh, uh, at the time, and we stayed there until we were able to 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 develop uh, the the, uh, the the first television studio for the university. The thing that triggered that was the fund for adult education, another. Uh, division of the Ford Foundation. The Fund for Adult Education by this time had become very interested in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, the prospects of television and uh, was, was, was thinking in terms of, of helping some additional stations get started. We applied to, uh, Bob Blakely was the head of uh, who was, was quite an adult, uh, nationally known adult educator, uh, was the head of the Fund for Adult Education. <clears throat> and we, uh, uh, I, I, I can still remember putting together the, uh, uh, the application. Uh, they came out, they investigated, and uh, they awarded uh, the university $100,000 uh, toward uh, constructing uh, the first studio for the University of, of, of Nebraska. We were so pleased with that that we had a great big blow up of the hundred thousand dollar <laughs> check made. I, I don't know whether it's still around or not, but that was that was a lot of money in those days. Uh, not that it isn't now, but uh, it was it was a massive amount then. <clears throat> uh, we arranged through the NAEB to have a small team of consultants, a three-person team, uh, come out, and uh, this was this this there, there was funding uh, provided for this, so we were able to convince NAEB to uh, uh, to provide this service to us to come out and to investigate several different sites. Uh, and to make recommendations as to where <clears throat> the studio should be placed. Uh, one such was uh, an old building off campus that I think uh, had 
been used by, uh, I don't know, it was, the, the, it was vacated space, but it was absolutely terrible space. And there, there were a couple of other possibilities, <coughs> the best of which, however, was uh, the basement of the uh, temple building, which obviously was on, was, was on campus. And uh, the speech department was and, 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 and theater were, were in there, and so it was the logical place to put this. And uh, we then went to work uh, and uh, worked with uh, a, a local architect to design that space. Uh, <laughs> we had in that basement one large room, but the large room right in the center of it had a major supporting pillar. <laughs> and we knew that 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 was going to cause problems. The largest amount of funding at the time to, to, to uh, really uh, develop the studio went to place a major steel I-beam, large I-beam, like this, across in order to remove that pillar. And it was, an, it was something of a, uh, an engineering feat to take this long uh, I-beam and see it inserted through a window on 12th and R Street to see it put in and ultimately uh, 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 take its required strength so that the pillar could have uh, could have been removed, but it worked and uh, allowed us to see that pillar removed. We had that studio, we had a control room, and we had another little room uh, adjacent to both the studio and the control room, and we put a a window, uh, a large window in that room. It must have been a, a 10 by 12, maybe. And we put a window in there so that we could take the cameras that had been given us by KOLN <clears throat> and we could shoot through the window so that that could become a second studio. <laughs> that, little, that little thing. But, uh, and, and then we obviously had, had uh, some additional room, uh, one large room for uh, uh, for offices and uh, another small one, but that was that was it, and that lasted us uh, for for a, a a long long time. Now this was uh, what year that uh, that you were able to have the studios for KULN independent of the KULN uh, operation. I'm trying to recall. I think it must have been about 1960, somewhere along in there. And uh, that was a marvelous day <clears throat> when we were able to uh, sign on in our own studios and, uh, and, and, and leave uh, KOLN because it opened the opportunity then for us to start programming uh, a, a number of other hours of the day uh, and not restrict ourselves to the 9 to 12 uh, length. Uh, and. Uh, we were so proud of that that we, at one point, uh, invited the KOLN staff down to the, the, the new studio uh, so that we could uh, thank them for, the, uh, uh, for putting up with us for, uh, for such, a period of, uh, such a period of time. Who were some of the uh, employees uh, that you brought on board uh, during the uh, period in which you were starting to establish uh, the independent operation of KUON-TV? Uh, the first one uh, that, that I brought aboard was a fellow by the name of Leo Geyer, who helped me very much with the, uh, with the Great Plains Trilogy series and packaging some other programs. Uh, he ultimately uh, uh, was offered a job at Johns Hopkins University. Johns Hopkins at the time had a very successful uh, medical educational program that they were uh, seeing placed on a number of stations. Uh, Bob Slater 
was another uh, early and important, uh, important uh, uh, a new member of, of, of the staff. Bob had been a graduate of uh, the university and, uh, and uh, 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 helped uh, considerably uh, until such time, he, he got so intrigued with it uh, that at some point uh, he went on to Michigan State to do graduate work and, <clears throat> and then uh, stayed on uh, actually to, uh, to teach it, uh, radio, uh, to teach tele uh, television at Michigan State. Uh, two others very important to this, these early days, were a fellow by uh, the name of <coughs> Norris Heinemann who I believe had a master's degree, a new master's degree from, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Syracuse University, and uh, Ron Hull, who uh, came to us bright-eyed and bushy-tailed with a brand new master's degree from Syracuse. Syracuse, by this time, Syracuse had, uh, had, had, had seen the potential and had the resources to develop a master's program, and uh, it was one of the first in the country, and it really attracted a, a number of people uh, 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 who uh, have, have gone on to do uh, great things. But Ron, uh, we recruited him, and uh, he joined us, and, uh, and uh, obviously has been a, uh, a strong part of the development of uh, Nebraska educational telecommunications ever since. I, th those th those were the uh, those were the original people. What did these people? What were their responsibilities? It sounds as if they were doing almost everything as you were at that point. <laughs> I'll say they were doing almost everything. Each of us wore at least three hats <laughs> yeah, during during that time, but it was fun because uh, we, uh, we we were uh, we, we we were plowing new ground too then and. Uh, there, there, there were very, f very few rules and restrictions, and so you, 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 you innovated and invented it as you, as, as you went along. And uh, so each of us had to do uh, a number of things, so what? Uh, but uh, it, was a, it, it, it was a good group, and it was a creative group. One of the things that has been, uh, to my way of thinking, uh, uh, most uh, in, in enjoyable and significant is through the years uh, Nebraska Educational tele uh, Television and Telecommunications has had the opportunity to, to bring in uh, a number of very talented and creative people. Uh, a number have, have, have been responsible for, the, uh, for what has been developed here. Jack, how did you make ends meet in the early days with uh, with the very ambitious schedules and ideas and so forth, but yet uh, not much money and apparently um, just an emerging consciousness of television in the way of the university administration? Well, you, you're right. There wasn't there wasn't very very much money, uh, so uh, you uh, and and everything was live. Everything was as live as live can be. Uh, because this was this was even <coughs> uh, it, it was just about the time that the kinescope had been developed. General Precision Lab <coughs> in uh, uh, Pleasantville, New York, had uh, developed this 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 kinescope machine, which which um, actually was a special 16 millimeter film camera focused very directly on an image orthogon <laughs> camera. And it was a finicky process, but it was the only one there was to, to really uh, record uh, live television programs. And that's, that's what was used to distribute uh, programs throughout the fledgling educational television uh, networking uh, system, but but uh, uh, <coughs> in terms of <coughs> excuse me, in terms of staging, you're absolutely right. Uh, we, we we did a lot of things for virtually no no money, <coughs> borrowing wherever we could, and uh, and. Uh, the, the, the programs, in, for the most part, very simply done, 
<clears throat> in those days. Not too much opportunity to use uh, to, to use scenery, uh, and uh, you just uh, innovated wherever wherever you went. What was the coverage area in Channel Twelve K U O N T B at this time? Probably about uh, thirty miles in a radius from uh, Lincoln. It it very definitely did not reach Omaha. Uh, but since television for Nebraska had begun in Omaha with uh, Channel 3 and Channel uh, 6, uh, and uh, they, were, they were pumping out quite a bit of power, uh, most of Lincoln had put up tall roof antennas to be able to receive the Omaha stations. That's where, that's where Lincoln... Uh, got its uh, original uh, television re reception until such time as the uh, the two Lincoln stations had been been uh, uh, activated, and people were still watching not only Channel 10 and 12 in in Lincoln but watching the the Omaha stations too at the at the time, but we with our signal uh, could only reach uh, Lincoln and environs at the time. Some people describe uh, uh, the um, arrangement in which John Fetzer um, uh, provided the opportunity for the university to acquire Channel 12 as enlightened self-interest because it, it gave the university the opportunity to operate, but it also decreased the commercial competition at that stage of the game. What do you recall about the uh, discussions that the university people had when they accepted the channel? Well, <coughs> I think uh, th there was... To, to, to anyone, it was obvious that uh, that uh, it was removing the possibility of a commercial station in uh, in Lincoln. But the problem was that with Lincolnites attuned to receiving Omaha channels, both Lincoln stations were losing money. And at the time, I think. Uh, anyone knowledgeable realized that uh, uh, it was not possible to to see two Lincoln stations so close to Omaha uh, <coughs> actually compete successfully. So that being the case at the time, I think that there were it was uh, it, it, it was recognized that uh, here was an opportunity. <coughs> excuse me, here was an opportunity for for the university uh, to, a, as a land-grant institution, to uh, think in terms of using this as another way to extend the resources of the university. Granted, only uh, at the time uh, it could be seen uh, by a limited number of Nebraskans, but there was always the future, and there might be some possibilities in the future for, for uh, expansion. So um, <clears throat> the, the Clifford Hardin, as, as chancellor, before the decision was made and before he took his recommendation to the uh, Board of Regents, he activated a citizens committee to investigate this. And uh, Byron Dunn was a member of that. And, uh, uh, as, as were a number of uh, other uh, well-known businessmen. And I think somewhere in our archives uh, there, 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 there's a picture of uh, a number of uh, a number of those uh, uh, O Street gang members, if you will, uh, at, uh, at, at, in, in Byron Dunn's conference room at the National Bank of Commerce <coughs> uh, discussing this. And they encouraged Cliff Harden to, uh, to accept this and he took it to the regents, and, and they did. <clears throat> you mentioned, uh, I think, in terms of the new location for KUON in the basement of the Temple Building, that uh, I think he said the cameras had been given by KOLN. Where did the equipment come from? Was some of it from KOLN? Was some of it purchased new? Uh, <clears throat> no, none of it was purchased <laughs> new. <clears throat> it was all, it was all uh, uh, the uh, equipment uh, from, uh, uh, from, uh, I don't know whether it was KFOR-TV or KOLN-TV equipment, but <clears throat> it was from 
that 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 mix that we we got that, and of course the transmitter remained out at KOLN, and our antenna <laughs> remained on the tower, and so one of the things that I, I oh I hadn't thought about this for a long time, but one of one of the things w we had to do before the temple building location was was firmed, we went to College of Engineering faculty, <clears throat> and we said. We have a problem. We need to be able to put a microwave, a studio to transmitter link between the top of the temple building and uh, out to the KOLN tower. Is that possible? Because we've got to have direct line, line of sight. And uh, uh, one or two of the faculty took this on as a, uh, a civil engineering project and affirmed that yes, it was possible <clears throat> if we put at such and such a height above the temple building uh, roof, we would be able to have direct line of sight and uh, that solved that problem. Now Jack, when, when, when in this time did the uh, responsibilities of primary administration sort of overcome your natural inclination to do the production and the writing and the and the camera on your shoulder stuff. When, when, when what? When did you move almost entirely to administration and away from oh. the, the, the production and the camera and the writing and so forth that you did earlier? Oh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I did that with great, great reluctance because I enjoyed very much uh, 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 both, both producing and, and, and directing and, uh, and uh, in, in some respects hated to, uh, to turn that over. But I guess it must have been uh, pretty much at the time that we uh, we uh, activated the, uh, the, uh, the 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 studios uh, at uh, in, in in the temple building <clears throat> when I had to cease uh, actually doing doing programming myself and. Uh, pretty much uh, attend to the administrative parts of this. When did the KUON signal become more powerful and, and be, be able to reach Omaha? Well, <clears throat> uh, not for quite a while. There were, we, we, we knew that we had to, we would have to do a number of things <clears throat> to be able to justify extension of the signal. One of the very important things that was done in the late 1950s was <clears throat> the opportunity to, to, to experiment with television in formal education. Uh, and we were able to put in a major application <clears throat> to the Fund for the Advancement of Education. <clears throat> this too, this was another division of the Ford Foundation along with the Fund for Adult Education. The Fund for the Advancement of Education <clears throat> was very interested in supporting the use of television to increase and improve the quality of uh, elementary and secondary education. And interestingly enough, we found that the head, <clears throat> the president of the Fund for the Advancement of Education was a fellow by the name of Alexander J. Stoddard who had been a very successful superintendent of schools uh, in Los Angeles and then went from there uh, to, to, to head this unit of the Ford Foundation up. But interestingly, A.J. Stoddard, extremely well known across the country, was a Nebraska native <coughs> who had been a superintendent of a very, very early in his career, a superintendent of a very small town 
in Nebraska and started. <clears throat> the chairman of a university television committee was Knut Brody, the director of con the Division of Continuing Education at the university. As a matter of fact, the, that television committee had been activated by George Round even before I came, and it was the television committee with George that hired me. <coughs> the television committee continued for some time as an advisory, uh, 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 even, e even until the time that uh, we, uh, we, we began operating the station. Knut Brody had considerable experience, as, as, as you would know, uh, in terms of high school correspondence study. And <clears throat> we devised a, an extensive application to, to A.J. Stoddard to put money into uh, the use of television in combination with correspondence study, particularly to improve the instruction of small enrollment high schools. Stoddard and the Fund for the Advancement of Education, for the most part, were putting money into major, uh, major uh, uh, communities, uh, metropolitan areas, because they, 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 they saw television being able to, to handle large classes. But this idea intrigued him to try out something with small enrollment. We were able to get something like three years of major funding, and that allowed us then to use KUON and Channel 12 to beam the first television programs out, and that's when Esther Montgomery first was loaned from Lincoln High to, to, to start this off. Steve Watkins, then superintendent of schools, became very interested in, uh, uh, in uh, educational television as a result. And we were able to, to, uh, to uh, uh, solicit the interest of a number of superintendents of small schools surrounding uh, Crete, uh, Waverly, and, and so forth and so on. And we were able to introduce the combination of live television classes together with uh, supplemental materials, uh, printed materials, uh, correspondent study materials. This worked quite well, so much so <clears throat> that it introduced uh, the concept of, of, of uh, educational, formal educational television. The Fund for the Advancement of Education uh, grant, it was known that it would be available only for three years. At the end of that time, we and Steve Watkins and the superintendents had a series of meetings to decide, is this going to be continued? Thereupon was born the Nebraska Council for Educational Television incorporated on a nonprofit basis, comprised of the superintendents of those schools. We used that as the opportunity to try to begin extending the signal of Channel 12. And by using a, by hook and crook, we were able to do it. We were able to, to, uh, to, to add uh, several uh, television translators or, or repeaters outside the area, the immediate co broadcast coverage area, to be able to extend and add a few more schools. And then we were able, and this was a terribly important step, far more than I knew at the time, we were able to get a television station in Scotts Bluff, a commercial television station in Scotts Bluff, to take a little some of our programming. 
which was which was kinescope programming by this time. We had a kinescope recorder, our own, and we bicycled those those films <clears throat> out to the station in uh, in Scotts Bluff that was donating the, the, the uh, giving us the time. The reason that was terribly important is that George Gertis, State Senator George Gertis, uh, from that area was able to see his granddaughter who was participating in some schools programming, some of our programming out there. And he saw how his granddaughter was was really uh, reacting to this and improving in terms of 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 uh, 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 teaching and 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 learning. That became very important because George Gertis was a key figure in the Nebraska legislature, and one of a handful of Nebraska legislatures uh, legislators that were were uh, instrumental, most instrumental, in terms of moving, mo moving forward. So we worked through the Nebraska Council for Educational Television in succeeding years. We kept adding a few more schools and a few more schools. Then came the opportunity to, to, to think in terms of a, a, a statewide uh, plan and at the time there still were a, a, a few uh, television channels unused. We went to <clears throat> the leadership of Nebraska Education under the banner of the Nebraska Council for Educational Television and got letters of support from the presidents of the state colleges and the universities and ever so many letters from uh, uh, school superintendents <clears throat> and put in an, a, an application to the Federal Communications Commission uh, for uh, a number of, 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 of uh, licenses that might provide statewide, statewide coverage. We were able to secure a grant from the Ford Foundation of $25,000 to assist in designing the plan and we hired outside uh, Washington DC <clears throat> engineering consultants Jansky and Bailey to come in and work with us to develop that plan so that we were able early on to seek and get construction permits for the largest block of still available VHF channels and some UHF channels uh, to, to, to see this, this move forward. We were also able to get the interest of Governor Morrison at the time. And the grant allowed the opportunity for him to appoint a blue ribbon panel, statewide panel, to investigate the development of a possible uh, statewide network. And that panel worked with us to develop this, this, this overall plan, which was then taken to the governor and to the legislature. and. Uh, uh, debated rather <laughs> extensively before it finally became in 1963 uh, 
the Nebraska Educational Television Act was passed, and the act did several things uh, very importantly. It created a new state agency, the Nebraska Educational Television Commission. It called for, secondly, it called for the expansion of, of uh, uh, educational television broadcast service statewide. And thirdly, and very importantly, it uh, directed that one-third of a three-cent uh, cigarette tax uh, uh, increase would be earmarked for this development. And it was that, then, that gave us the funding. And according to the phased plan we had developed, the first phase <coughs> was relocation of the Channel 12 tower and antenna and increase in power so that Channel 12 would be able to serve greater Omaha as well as all of the current service and therefore give us the largest uh, uh, opportunity to reach the greatest number of Nebraskans with one, with one uh, uh, transmitter in tower. Jackie, you talked about the interest of um, uh, Senator Gertis um, and uh, Governor Morrison. Um, talk a little bit more about the uh, individuals who were incorporated on a nonprofit basis comprised of the superintendents of those schools. We used that as the opportunity to try to begin extending the signal of Channel 12. And by using a, by hook and crook, we were able to do it. We were able to, to, uh, to, to add uh, several uh, television translators or, or repeaters outside the area, the immediate co broadcast coverage area, to be able to extend and add a few more schools. And then we were able, and this was a terribly important step, far more than I knew at the time, we were able to get a television station in Scotts Bluff, a commercial television station in Scotts Bluff, to take a little, some of our programming, which was, which was kinescope programming by this time. We had a kinescope recorder, our own. And we bicycled those, those films <clears throat> out to the station in, uh, in Scotts Bluff that was donating, the, 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 uh, giving us the time. The reason that was terribly important is that George Gertis, State Senator George Gertis, uh, from that area was able to see his granddaughter who was participating in some schools programming, some of our programming out there. And he saw how his granddaughter was was really uh, reacting to this and improving in terms of, of, of uh, 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 teaching and, and, and learning. That became very important because George Gertis was a key figure in the Nebraska legislature and one of a handful of Nebraska legislatures, uh, legislators that were, were uh, instrumental, most instrumental, in terms of moving, mo moving forward. So we worked through the Nebraska Council for Educational Television in succeeding years. We kept adding a few more schools and a few more schools. Then came the opportunity to, to, to think in terms of a, a, a statewide uh, plan. And at the time, there still were a, a, a few uh, television channels unused. We went to <clears throat> the leadership of 
Nebraska Education under the banner of the Nebraska Council for Educational Television and got letters of support from the presidents of the state colleges and the universities and ever so many letters from uh, uh, school superintendents <clears throat> and put in an, a, an application to the Federal Communications Commission uh, for uh, a number of, 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 of uh, licenses that might provide statewide, statewide coverage. We were able to secure a grant from the Ford Foundation of $25,000 to assist in designing the plan. And we hired outside uh, Washington, D.C. <clears throat> engineering consultants, Jansky and Bailey, to come in and work with us to develop that plan so that we were able early on to seek and get construction permits for the largest block of still available VHF channels and some UHF channels uh, to, to, to see this, this move forward. We were also able to get the interest of Governor Morrison at the time. And the grant allowed the opportunity for him to appoint a blue ribbon panel, statewide panel, to investigate the development of a possible uh, statewide network. And that panel worked with us to develop this, this, this overall plan, which was then taken to the governor and to the legislature and uh, uh, debated rather <laughs> extensively before it finally became, in 1963, uh, the Nebraska Educational Television Act was passed and the act did several things uh, very importantly. It created a new state agency, the Nebraska Educational Television Commission. It called for, secondly, it called for the expansion of, of uh, uh, educational television broadcast service statewide. And thirdly, and very importantly, it uh, directed that one-third of a three-cent uh, cigarette tax uh, uh, increase would be earmarked for this development. And it was that then that gave us the funding. And according to the phased plan we had developed, the first phase <coughs> was relocation of the channel 12 tower and antenna and increase in power so that channel 12 would be able to serve greater Omaha as well as all of the current service and therefore give us the largest uh, uh, opportunity to reach the greatest number of Nebraskans with one, with one uh, uh, transmitter and tower. Jack, you talked about the interest of um, uh, Senator Gertis um, and uh, Governor Morrison, um, talk a little bit more about the uh, individuals who were important to this leadership development that came from uh, the idea from KUL and TV about the establishment of the statewide network and how that was put together. <coughs> Dick Marvel was very important. Richard Marvel from from Hastings, who saw this and uh, and and became a champion of it. And this was terribly important because for many years. He was chairman of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, he was quite important to us. Fern Orm, Senator Fern Orm of Lincoln, was, was quite instrumental. 
Elvin Adamson from, uh, from out uh, in the western part of the state. A colleague of George Gerdes was another one very important. Ross Rasmussen, uh, very important as chairman of the Education Committee at the time. And that was, the Education Committee had to be very involved. Those, that, that group, I'm sure I'm leaving out a, a few others, but that group was really the nucleus of, of, uh, of, of the development. Uh, Where did the idea come from the, to create the commission? Uh, it was known that there needed to be some state entity to, to be responsible for this <clears throat> because it was known that, that, that really this needed to benefit both formal education at all levels and uh, the general public as well and that there was no existing institution or agency that had that whole responsibility. And we looked around at other states and there were a couple of other state uh, uh, networks. Alabama, I believe, had been the first uh, educational television network which had gone the commission route. And so there were, there, 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 there were several that were either commissions or state authorities for educational television. And so it became obvious that it, it, was, it was this kind of an approach that we needed, but an approach that would continue directly to involve the university because of its importance, that would involve the state colleges, uh, that would involve uh, elementary and secondary education and involve the, the general public. Uh, <clears throat> subsequent to that, uh, a, 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 as the community college uh, system developed, that was added, uh, that representation was added to the commission as well. Where did the idea for the, uh, the use of the one-third of the cigarette tax come from? <clears throat> I'm not sure. I, uh, I, I know uh, uh, just where that came from. I, I do know that, uh, that uh, this was uh, uh, a, uh, uh, an opportunity, uh, as far as the senators were concerned, to, uh, to, to, to see some additional revenue generated. I do know that another third of that cigarette tax increase went to the Game and Parks Commission because it was used, their third was used to build the building uh, that is not too far from us here on North 33rd Street. And I can't remember what the third third went for, but it just amazed me and others that one third of a three cent cigarette tax increase, or in, in other words, a one cent, would generate as much money as it did. and and. Uh, this then gave us the funding not only to move, move uh, 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 Channel 12 and put up a brand new tower and uh, move the antenna, but it gave us the uh, funding so that we could begin subsequent phases. And then in, in over a six-year period, the legislature between 63 and 69 gave us sufficient funding so that we could uh, continue to activate other stations of the network until we had all nine stations uh, uh, activated. Yeah, this is kind of an aside, but you probably know the answer to this. Where did the call letters for KUON and for the various stations in the television network come from? I, I, I didn't have the opportunity to decide on KUON. Uh, uh, that was either John Fetzer, Jim Ebel, or, or, or uh, Cliff Harden, or a combination of the three. It was a natural University of Nebraska, K-U-O-N. Was anything else ever considered? <coughs> Pardon? Was any other call letters considered, to your knowledge? I have no, I have no knowledge, but uh, it was such a natural that that, that worked well. But, but I did have a, a hand <laughs> in all of the rest of, of the call letters. And what we were doing, uh, we were trying to... to, to uh, uh, get a series that uh, that were identified uh, as as a group of network stations, 
and uh, that's how we ended up with the particular call letters we uh, we uh, we're, we're now using. Were the when the numbers of stations in the um, in the network were the, was that determined primarily by what was technically possible, or by the channels which were available, or the money, or, or the combination? How was the decision made? All of the above. Test? All of the above. Obviously. Uh, television allocations were of prime importance because you can't just place, as you well know, you can't just place uh, a television station anywhere uh, with, because of uh, severe restrictions having to do with uh, potential interference and so forth. Uh, television channels are allocated very specifically uh, uh, in certain areas with uh, with major restrictions as to how much you can move them around. So it was a combination of, of uh, what was possible and it was a combination of, of uh, what uh, tower heights were necessary in order to secure what grade A, B, and C uh, coverage areas uh, would, would, would be possible as well. It was all of this that, that moved the engineering consultants and us to determine uh, the locations that we use to this day. Yeah, and how are the, uh, the decisions made to add the low-power repeaters referred to as translators to, to the network? Well, uh, in, with, it, with every, every state uh, uh, network, there, uh, there, there was need to think in terms of uh, pockets, uh, coverage pockets, uh, where, where there, there was trouble. The television signal uh, is influenced by the topography and uh, uh, by hollows and uh, geography and so forth. And uh, 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 we were able to determine uh, rather conclusively through technical uh, measurements uh, what areas uh, were the principal problems. And uh, the problems were solved by, by putting in, by activating, low-power automated television transmitters, which were called translators. Uh, in some instances, we were able to use an existing tower and simply rent space upon which to put a very small antenna and uh, put a hut at the bottom of it for this automated equipment. In some places we had to put up a, a, a short tower of our own. Uh, in, in a couple of places we were able to put it on the top, on the roof of a building, uh, uh, an existing building, and simply lease space. But we now have, I believe it's 19 translators, uh, very strategically placed, some of them in, 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 in communities uh, in low-lying areas uh, adjacent to, to rivers. But this, this affords us to, to give virtually 99% uh, broadcast coverage for the Nebraska ETV network. Jack, we could go on longer, <laughs> and we will do that in another session. But in order to meet the time schedules today, we thank you very much, and we'll stop at this point. Good.